All right, so today what we're gonna look at is the chapter eight homework for McGraw-Hill. And what this homework is really gonna look at is our long-term assets. So one of the main things that we're gonna be talking about here is what we call P, P, and E. Now, right now in the news, there's a lot of talk about P, P, and E. But in the news, when you hear about P, P, and E right now, you're mostly hearing about personal and protective equipment. So now what I want you to think about when you hear P, P, and E in accounting. In accounting, PP&E stands for Property, Plant, and Equipment. So this is what I need you to think about when you hear PP&E in terms of accounting. And what we're going to look at here is many different scenarios where we look at things like how we're going to record the purchase of PP&E, how we're going to devalue that systematically over time, we're going to look at what happens when we sell that, all the different methods of depreciation, what happens when we have a bulk purchase. And we're going to look at all this stuff and kind of take each one of these items as we go. I just kind of wanted to give you a rundown of, of kind of the direction that we're going to look at in this video. Now, the focus of this video in regard to PP&E tends to run pretty much around the idea of depreciation. And when you hear depreciation, what I want you to think is that this is a systematic devaluation of a long-term asset. Now, that's just kind of the way that I define depreciation. The book says something slightly different. But this is the way that I always think about it and the way that makes the most sense to me. This includes all the main pieces that we need when we think about depreciation. Because we know inherently that over time, equipment becomes less valuable to us. And you say, well, well, why is that? And if you think, think way back, right, whenever Apple first came out, say, with their first iPhone. Okay, this isn't quite PP&E, but it might be a little bit easier to understand. And you had that brand new iPhone 1, for example, or that brand new Mac computer that they came out with when they very first opened up and started selling electronics. Now, if you had that at the time, you probably thought that was a great technological innovation and it was going to be very useful, and it was. But here 10, 15, 20 years later, maybe if you try to use that same piece of equipment now, it's not going to do the same stuff that you need it to because it hasn't been caught up to where we're at now in technology. So if you take that away from something small like an iPhone and move it into things like a building, you'll realize that that brand new building you just built or that brand new piece of machinery that you just bought, while very effective, efficient, and working very well now, over time, that's not going to be the case. Over time, that equipment is going to become slower. It's going to need more work done on it. All these different types of things are going to cause us to need to record a reduction in the value of that equipment. And that is what depreciation does for us. But when we look at this definition, I want to kind of go word by word. And, and the first thing that we see here is the word systematic. What this means is I'm not just devaluing my equipment by $100 this year, $1,000 next year, $200 the year after that, $4,000 after that. Right, it's not just a random writing down of the equipment. Instead, there's an actual method to this write down. The next piece is, of course, the devaluation, showing that over time our equipment becomes less valuable. Our buildings become less valuable. So we're going to actually look at how we devalue these, item, these items. And it is a long-term issue. Because if it was current, then it would just be able to be expensed in the current period. There would be no reason to deal with all of this, this work. So this is what we're going to be looking at in this chapter. So to begin, we're going to look at question number one, and we're just going to see exactly what it asks us to do. So in question one, it tells us that we are trying to assign costs to plant assets. So if we just zoom in a little bit, it'll tell us, listed below are costs or discounts to purchase or construct new plant assets. Okay, so purchase or construct new plant assets. And we want to indicate... <clears throat> whether these costs should be expensed or capitalized. Now, when you see the word capitalized, what I want you to think is this is a cost that goes 
on the balance sheet. Okay, So that's what I want you to think. When you see the word capitalized, what we're saying is should this go on the balance sheet? When you see the word expensed, then that will go to the income statement. Okay. And that's all that we're going to see here. Okay, is that if something is expensed, it goes to the income statement, and if something is capitalized, it will go to the balance sheet. So now we'll look at these examples and kind of talk through them as we go. So the first one here tells us that we're going to be looking at insurance on a building after construction is complete and it is in use. But once construction is complete, all right, then it will just be expense. Okay? This is just insurance. It's just a debit to insurance expense, a credit to cash, and we just move on down the line. Now for number two, we see that we're going to permit charges incurred by a delivery driver to transport new equipment to the warehouse. Now, when we talked previously about asset valuation, what we said was that we're going to include, of course, the purchase price of the asset. We said, of course, that'll be included. Then we said delivery costs. This is shipping. If we pay for it. And then three, we said kind of a blanket statement, any other costs necessary to get the asset available for its intended use. And that's what we said, right? So in this case, this shipping charges, or these shipping charges that are required here, would fall under category two. So that will be capitalized as part of the balance of equipment on the balance sheet. Now, janitorial costs to clean equipment, right? That's just a day to day activity. So, what we're going to say here is that's just going to be expensed in the current period. Next, we've got insurance on a new building during construction. Okay. Well, it is still insurance. We are still building this. So it is during the building phase or during the construction phase. So it will be capitalized because that is part of the cost of getting that equipment or that building ready to be worked on. Okay. So if you look at number one and then you look at number four, you'll see that in number one, this is after construction. And number four is during construction. So during construction, the cost of insurance, that does get capitalized. But after the construction phase, when it's being used for its intended purpose, then insurance is just an expense. So the next question here says, number five, we're going to look at sales taxes on new equipment that is purchased. Well, that would be one of these any other costs down here in point three. Right? You can't buy the equipment without paying the sales taxes. So that will, of course, be capitalized. Next, we see costs to clear and grade the land. Well, that will be capitalized, but be very careful here because this falls into the land. This does not fall into part of the value of the plant or the building, but instead is accounted for separately in the land account. We'll dig into why that's so important later, but for now, just be aware of that. Next, we've got property tax on land incurred after it was purchased. So if it is after purchase, it is expensed. And repair cost to fix new equipment damaged by the crew that unpacked it. Well, that is an expense because that is not necessary to the operation, right? We don't expect our crew to damage stuff. If they do, that is not a cost incurred in the usual course of business. So that will be expensed. Okay, And that brings us to the end of number one. So now we're going to move on to question number two. And in question number two, we're going to look at our first example of computing depreciation. But in this case, we're actually going to do revised depreciation. Now, what this means is at some point, we're going to decide that we have changed part of our estimate to record depreciation. So we're going to look at this together. 
On January 1st, the Matthews Band pays $65,000 for sound equipment. The band estimates it will use this for four years, and after four years can sell the equipment for $1,000. So what is this $1,000? Well, that $1,000 is what we call salvage value. And that is for 1000 Our historical cost, or you could just call this cost, equals $65,400. And our life is going to just be four years. Now, which of these are estimates? Well, salvage value is an estimate, and life is an estimate. The cost is not an estimate because we know exactly how much we paid for this. So as we go through this, you know the cost cannot change. What can change is either salvage value or the life. So it tells us here that Matthews Band uses straight line depreciation. And if we recall that formula from a previous lecture, what we would say is that straight line depreciation, I'm gonna abbreviate this as SLD, straight line depreciation, is equal to cost, right? Which is my historical cost minus salvage value divided by estimated useful life. And this formula, as written right now, will work most of the time. But there is one small adjustment we need to take into consideration in certain cases, and this is times the portion of year owned. What that means is in this case, we did actually buy this on January the 1st. So we do actually need to take an entire year's worth of depreciation. But if this had been bought on July 1st, then we would have only recorded depreciation for the months of July, August, September, October, November, and December. So in that case, we would have only recorded six months worth of depreciation. But in this question, we actually do need to record the full 12 months because we did purchase this on January the 1st. Okay, so do be aware of that. And we'll move on in this question. It then tells us we realize at the start of the second year, the equipment will last only a total of three years. The salvage value has not been changed. So what changed? Well, I'm going to do this in red. This has now changed to three total. Okay. So now let's calculate our original depreciation. So our original depreciation formula said cost, which was $65,400 minus salvage of $1,000 divided by four years of life. And that gave me 64,400 divided by four, which is $16,100 worth of depreciation per year. Okay. And that is what I would have seen in each of all four years if no changes had been made. However, some changes were made. So what we're gonna have to do is when that change gets made, then we have to actually make some adjustments. So I'm just gonna jot down here to the left, that 16,100, so we can keep track of it. I'm gonna say original depreciation, and this was for the first year, was $16,100. Now, when we get ready to make this adjustment, what we're gonna to have to do is remember that we've already accounted for some of this depreciation. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to calculate what is called my book value. And my book value, as we know, is cost minus accumulated depreciation. So in this case, that'll be 65,400 minus 16,100. And that will bring me down to a book value of $49,300. You say, well, well, how did you know there was $16,100 in accumulated depreciation? I'm glad you asked that because that's a great question. And what you would have seen if we had done the journal entry was that at December 31st of year one, the journal entry we would have recorded would have been a debit to depreciation expense 
for $16,100 and a credit to accumulated depreciation for $16,100. Now at the end of the year, depreciation expense gets closed and this gets closed in this textbook first to income summary and then to retained earnings. Okay. In the real world, we likely skip this income summary step and go straight to retained earnings. But in this textbook, the book does like to use the income summary account. So we're going to do that here. And that is all this going on. So what you see then is that this balance of 16100 from this journal entry just drops right into this calculation here. So I know there's a lot of moving pieces, but hopefully taking the time to go through that extra information makes this make a little bit more sense to us and helps us place everything a little bit more accurately. So now <clears throat> when we look at this, instead of using my cost, I'm going to rewrite this as using book value minus salvage value divided by remaining life. And in this case, what we see is that my book value of 49300 drops straight down. Then I still back out my $1,000 estimated salvage value. I divide this by my remaining life. Now we're told up in the facts that at the beginning of the second year, this equipment will last only a total of three years. So what you might be tempted to do if you were doing this very quickly is come in here and drop a three on the bottom. Please do not do that because the question said a total of three years. And when did this happen? At the beginning of the second year, which means our denominator is really three minus one or two. So then if I take my 48,300 that is now on my top, I divide that by two, I'll come out to the $24,150 worth of depreciation for year two and year three. And that will give me exactly what is needed to make this question work out. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully you see why this worked the way it did. Now, while we're here, I do want to point out one thing really quick, and that is that this deals with a change in estimate. So this question, oops, this question deals with a change. Okay, I'm going to use the delta symbol here. Delta, this little triangle here, just means change. So this question deals with a change in an estimate changes in estimates are dealt with prospectively what this means is that we're going to make these changes from the time we realize there needs to be a change onward but we're not going to go back and make corrections to prior periods. When we have certain other changes that we'll talk about later, we'll see that then we actually need to go back and use a retrospective approach and restate our prior financial statements. In this case, all we're doing is making our estimate for depreciation with the best knowledge we had at the time. Because of that, we're allowed to treat these prospectively so we don't have to go back in and rework years and years and years worth of records to bring everything back up using these new estimates. Because as soon as we get that reworked, there may be another change, and it's just not, it's just not good. So instead, we are allowed, when we have a change in an estimate, to deal with those changes prospectively. And that's what you just saw here. Okay. So next we'll look at number three. So for number three... What we're going to do is we're going to look at revenue and capital expenditures. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one and just kind of talk through them. So 
In 3A, we are told that we paid $54,000 to replace a motor on equipment that, extended, that extends its useful life by four years. So what this tells me is that I'm getting some long-term benefit out of this. And a capital expenditure, so let's just jot this down, a capital expenditure is a significant improvement. This could either dramatically improve efficiency or it could dramatically improve the life of this piece of equipment. And in this case, that's exactly what we see. A four-year increase in life is a huge benefit to that piece of equipment. So this is a capital expenditure in number one. In number two, it tells us that we paid $270 cash per truck for the cost of their annual tune-ups. Well, annual tune-ups is something that's done every year. It's not going to dramatically improve the life of the truck in and of itself. It's really just routine maintenance. And that's what we're going to see here is a revenue expenditure. And the way I'm going to define this is just routine maintenance. Okay. Or very small improvements. So for C, it tells us that we pay $216 for the monthly cost of replacement filters on an air conditioning system. Well, once again, that's just routine maintenance. So we're going to push that through as a revenue expenditure. And finally, we see that we completed an addition to a building for $300,000 in cash. A $300,000 improvement to the building as an addition is definitely going to be a capital expenditure because that is a significant improvement to the facilities. Okay, so that takes us to the first part of number three. So the second part of number three asks us to record the journal entries for transactions A and D. So what we see is for letter A, we paid $54,000 cash to replace the motor that extends the life. So we're going to debit the equipment account. And if you remember, equipment is an asset. So equipment is an asset on the balance sheet. And with a debit, it is increasing. Cash is an asset on the balance sheet, and it is decreasing because it is being credited. Now for number two, what we see is that we completed an addition to a building for $300,000 in cash. Once again, building is an asset that goes on the balance sheet and is increasing with a debit. And cash is an asset that is on the balance sheet that is decreasing because it is being credited. And that's all there is to number three. So hopefully that makes sense and we'll move on to number four. Number four, what we're looking at is natural resources. And instead of depreciation, we deal with depletion. So with depletion, what we're going to look at is really the same stuff that we do with depreciation. It's just for our natural resources. So if you get a question that asks you, what do we call the systematic devaluation of a natural resource? The answer is not depreciation. It is instead depletion. So here we see that Perez Company acquires an ore mine at a cost of $1,960,000. It incurs additional costs of $549,000 to access the mine, which is estimated to hold 1.4 million tons of ore. 200,000 tons of ore are mined and sold in the first year. The estimated value of the land after the ore is removed is $280,000. Calculate the depletion expense from the information given. So, what we've got to do here is instead of using straight line depreciation, we are going to use what is called the units of production method of depreciation. 